Pep Guardiola won 14 out of a possible 19 trophies at Barcelona. He won 7 trophies in 3 years at Bayern Munich. He's won 10 in 7 seasons at Man City, including 5 league titles. He's also broken the Premier League points record, and he's probably about to win the Champions League for the third time. He's one of the most successful managers ever. But how is he doing it? What makes him so good? What makes him different to every other manager? Well, a lot of it is to do with how his teams actually play, his tactics. And Guardiola's tactics are built around a discipline called positional play. Positional play is a set of principles or a concept in which players take up set positions to create numerical advantages through passing triangles and diamonds to allow a team to pass the ball through the thirds and control the pitch. For example, here is a triangle between Puyol, Xavi and Alves, and here is a diamond between Iniesta, Busquets, Xavi and Eto'o and Iniesta. Or perhaps, because you're playing with the ball all the way through, here is another diamond between these four here. This is what positional play creates. Now to make this work, players have to follow very strict instructions about where to be and when. You have to stay here, you have to stay here, and it all depends on where the ball is and where their teammates go, all dependent mostly on the ball really. So if, for example, Lionel Messi were to leave the right wing and move inside the pitch into here to play in these sorts of areas, that leaves this space empty in the structure. So then the right back might push up to fill that in. That then leaves a big gap here, which is bad in case someone counterattacks you. So what you might get is the defenders move across to form a more of a three and block more of the pitch in this area. That's one small example of it. But when you do that, what you then create is different passing angles. So of course, you then create your diamond here, or you've then got Valdez, with the triangle of these two center backs here, or you've got a triangle here. And then if Alves maybe comes inside the pitch, maybe Xavi might move in like this. This is the kind of thing that might happen within positional play. Now, Renus Michels introduced this concept way back in the day. Johan Cruyff took it on and made it even better, and he taught Pep Guardiola everything he knows, and then Guardiola has taken it to the next level, and he coaches it on a training pitch which looks like this. You may have seen pictures like this in the past. So what he does is divide the pitch into different zones. You get a wide space, you get a half space, central space, and a, again, a half space, then a wide space. But the idea is, you cannot have more than three players in a vertical line, here is a vertical line, and you can't have more than two players in a vertical space, like this. So by moving players all around to make sure you fit those positions. As we said before, the example would be if Messi moves inside to this half space, Alves then has to make sure that someone is in the wide space here. It doesn't have to be level with them up here, as long as you maintain your width, like this, and you make sure that players swap and rotate. And on the other side of the pitch in this situation, you've got Henri, so the left winger. He's stretching the pitch to make sure it's nice and wide, make sure that the back four of the opposition or the midfielders are stretched. Because if you are stretched like this, there's space in between for players to get in between your defenders. But if they're nice and compact like this, if you're squeezed in like that, there's no width, they can squeeze, and there's no space. So that's why you want to keep the width in this sort of situation. But say, for example, you've got Busquets here and the opposition are trying to mark him, they can't get the ball through. So he pulls out wide to make a bit of space, which means Xavi drops into this space here so they can get the ball to him. Well, that then means Iniesta is kind of in a situation where he's not much use. So he might move just a little bit around here to form a triangle like this, or he might then move into this space here, further up the pitch to drag someone away so that someone like this can drop in to also form that triangle. And when he's in here, maybe Abidal realizes that he can move up because you've got three here in a row so maybe he can push up a bit then Henri can make a run inside from here to become the striker so that basically there's always positions filled they're always protecting parts of the pitch and they're all sticking to strict instructions depending on where the ball is and where their teammates are and this creates constant rotations which allows teams like Barcelona to play dizzying little combinations of passes like they're in a rondo which then confuses teams it stretches the defense as well so they create gaps and space to be able to pass the ball through and it also crucially allows the manager to control the way that his team builds from the back all the way through the thirds so when they get to the final third he's got players in all the positions he wants maybe with lots of width to stretch the defense midfielders in the right positions to be able to pass the ball around and they can play a high line like this and that's what the control you get from it is but it doesn't have to be in a 4-3-3 because sometimes Guardiola would swap to something like a 3-4-3 and part of positional play is that players play multiple positions so if you suddenly pull Busquets back into this back three then you've got these two here. That something looks like it's you know not quite the same sort of shape. You move Messi inside to this half space, and then what you get straight away is two players in this half space line, two players here. You get width from Alves. Maybe he goes up and pushes wide. Suddenly you get your wingers. You still got three centre backs. You've got two midfielders, and it's a three-two-five that we see in modern day tactics all over the place. And then maybe you just get rid of a striker altogether because this is all about creating numerical superiority, particularly in midfield. So what Guardiola did once before a 6-2 thrashing of Real Madrid, a very famous game, is normally had Messi on this right wing where he's associating the entire time. 
what you did was put him into this false nine position. It's a Johan Cruyff thing that he kind of worked on. So Eto'o goes out, and what you do is put Pedro in here, or Villa the other way around maybe. And then what you get is that Messi starts up here as a, as a central striker, but drops into these positions. So you create this diamond all the time. And then you've got these wide players over here. And a couple of things happen with that. First of all, this defender, or this defender, who's going to be marking the center forward, doesn't have any reference point for who they want to mark. So maybe they pull out here, which then of course creates space in behind for this guy to go in. Or maybe that creates space for this guy to go in behind. Or maybe this guy to go in behind. Any number of players can do that. And as long as they keep the structure, this player can then pull all players out of position and Messi can then arrive in the box at the right time into the space he's created by pulling out to score loads of goals. And in one calendar year, 2012, Lionel Messi scored 79 goals <laughs> playing this exact position. And that was just Messi's a false nine. One other thing that Guardiola did was sign Cesc Fabregas, and we'll take out an extra player. Let's make it into the 3-4-3. We'll drop him into here. You've got two maybe here. Messi's a false nine. We'll take out Pedro, put in Fabregas, and you've got two false nines now. So then you get your width from these guys. This is the sort of thing you get, and he's playing the two false nines of Fabregas and Messi quite late onto his Barcelona career, but that's getting rid of the strikers, getting a numerical advantage in midfield with a box with players wide who can get in behind to cause all sorts of problems within the structure. And so to facilitate this dropping of the false nine in here and creating this numerical advantage, Guardiola needed his wingers to stay wide. What he had was players who were strikers like Thierry Henry, one of the best forwards of all time. Sami Eto'o, another one of the best forwards of all time. And he's getting them to stay tight to this touchline to stretch the defense and facilitate the movement of others in the middle of the pitch. But if you have someone like Thierry Henry, surely you don't want to have them just stuck wide on the side of the pitch, do you? Well, Guardiola has had to convince quite a few players too. He has said in the past, to make players understand the positional attack, which in my point of view is the most important. Make players understand that by not intervening, you are helping. By not intervening, you are helping. And this is very hard to understand even in very top level players. And that's Pep Guardiola's real voice. But why is it so hard for a player as amazing as Thierry Henry or Sami Eto'o to learn these instructions of positional play? Well, it's because players want to be protagonists, you see. To tell a player, you now stay open and in three minutes you're not going to touch the ball, but it will eventually come, or maybe not, and you have to wait more. But you have to wait there because that means you are opening up spaces in other parts of the pitch. The positional attack is very complicated. It is to be still and wait for the ball to reach you. So what he's saying here is players like Eto, like Henri, like Villa, they are there to facilitate the benefit of the team. They're making the team better by not being on the ball. And sure enough, they're not getting it a lot, but when they do, they'll be in the right place at the right time to be able to make the team better by maybe scoring. So everything is for the better of the team. Now Thierry Henry once talked about this on, I think it was Sky Sports, and he talked about what it was that Guardiola demanded of him and why he had to stay in this position, when normally you want to get him in this position to try and score. And there's an example he gave where he was subbed off after having scored because he disobeyed the rules of positional play. Now let's put them into a sort of position where they might have been, we'll make this up, right? But I'll put all these players around here, stick them up high up the pitch, is what you get. Henri's over here wide. Now, the play was over on this side of the pitch, round about here. You've got Messi, maybe Pedro, Xavi. Again, I'm making this all up, right? But the balls are in this sort of area. Henri wants to get involved, he wants to score. And he spots an opportunity to get in behind in this side of the pitch, comes in here. The balls come through to him, I think, and he ends up scoring from this side of the pitch when he needs to be here. Now, sure enough, he scores, but the problem with this is that Guardiola has lost control of the pitch. He wants to be able to control the counter-attack. Because if Henri is over here, and the ball bounces loose, say, say Messi tries to dribble, and then it bounces loose, and they try and put the ball up here, they can instantly try and press them from all different angles and win the ball back, because they've got people in position to be able to do that. But if Henri is over here, say, then that means that instantly they lose the ball, and it, the ball doesn't go through to him, they can then try and get the ball to this guy in space, which is the problem, because then he wants to come out and try and go over here to close him down, which then means he's free, he's free, this guy will push on here, and suddenly you've got players who can then counter-attack you, and you're in trouble. So part of positional play is not just the attack, it's all about defending as well. Because Guardiola wants to gain control in and out of possession with positional play. So what Barcelona wanted to do back in the day was keep the ball and just dominate the game, right? So to do that, they want to play a really high line, which obviously leaves space in behind your, your defense. They'd be really, really high up here. Now, if you're playing like this, the most logical way to stop the counter-attack and protect that space is to win the ball back early. And you may have heard of the five or six second rule that Barcelona had, where when they lose the ball, they instantly lock on to the player with the ball from all different ways to make sure that they can't get out of this little situation. So that's the kind of press. But the Barcelona press was not then to try and turn that into a counter-attack. Instead, what they did was they'd win the ball, and then because they're in position, all ready to go, they could then pass the ball around in these little quick triangles or pyramids until they can get back into their shape 
so that then they can start building attacks the way they want. So positional play isn't just for attack, it's to make sure that when you turn the ball over, you have players in the right positions to be able to win the ball back as quickly as possible to then get back into your shape and gain control of the game. And so after four years at Barcelona, Guardiola left behind one of the best club sides we'd ever seen. They won 14 out of possible 19 trophies, two European Cups. You had this uh, diamond of Messi, Busquets, Xavi and Iniesta with players like Puyol and Piquet behind them, Valdez is goalkeeper, very famous, an amazing team that played as well as it could do because of the things that Guardiola put in place. And then towards his last year, Jose Mourinho would come into Real Madrid, start trying to wind him up an awful lot, didn't like that, got really tired. Real Madrid, to beat Barcelona, had to break La Liga's all-time points record, wins record, uh, goal scored record, just to be able to beat this Barcelona team. That's how good Mourinho's Real Madrid had to be to beat Guardiola's Barcelona. And so after that, he was very tired, took a year out of the game, went in the gap year to explore, learn about himself. And then he came back after that to join Bayern Munich. Now this is sort of a, an amalgamation of many of the players that he's had over his time at Bayern Munich. But what Guardiola learned very quickly at Bayern was that he couldn't just simply copy and paste the Barcelona model and apply it here. It didn't work because Germany is a different country and the Bundesliga is a different league. He also had completely different players, players like Robben and Ribéry. He didn't really have that quality of winger when he was at Barcelona. He built it in the midfield and he lacked players like that too. He brought in Thiago to try and replicate it. He brought in Mario Goetze to try and play, where is he? To try and play the false nine role to gain uh, superiority here. But the difference is, like in Spain in La Liga, it's very slow, patient passing. There are lots of positional play and they keep possession. They play that sort of way. You know, Spain won the Euros in the World Cup in that sort of era. Then in Germany, what you had was a, a league where they specialised in transitional football, counter-attacks, counter-attacking with pace and power and momentum from back to forward. That's what you got. So Guardiola set about trying to merge what he knew from positional play and teach that into a team which had just won the treble under Jupp Hink is one of the best ever Bayern Munich sides. He's trying to teach that there. But he had to adapt and make a better version of his positional play model, one with an untwistable stomach. And the way he did this was starting to learn how to control the counter-attacks. And that's where you start seeing this thing where you get inside or inverted fullbacks. So David Alaba, a really talented youngster, you start playing inside the pitch like this. Philip Lamb came inside the pitch to play alongside a pivot like this. So you had a two and a three. Kimmich was a midfielder turned into a centre-back. Another thing that Guardiola's always done, you had Yaya Toure playing as centre-back, Yavi Mascherano always finds players that can play multiple positions. Kimmich was playing at centre-back, midfield, right-back, right-wing, right-inside, every single place you can put him. Alaba became a centre-back at certain times. You had Philip Lamb in the same sort of thing as Kimmich. Lots and lots of positional rotations. That's one of the things that he learned to do with these players here, to play in the system. And another key thing he learned was to base a lot of his play on wingers. So what you might have had in the past was your, your wingers would come inside the pitch eventually in the final third. So say we'll push them back a little bit here. Because eventually, rather than having Goetze, he had just an established number nine in Robert Lewandowski. And he came in and you want to put him straight up top as a number nine here. So what Guardiola might have done in the past was have his inside forwards playing on the wings. They'd come inside to be these sorts of uh, guys here. Then maybe a fullback would overlap, something like that to protect. Then maybe another one might push up a little bit, but you might have a player going wide to support. But what you had at Bayern was these guys would be wider in the start of moves so they could then get into this position. So to make sure you had these angles available, what he did was pull the fullbacks inside, like Lamb and Alaba, we say multi-positional players. And then that meant when, the, when they were attacking, this would then change even more. So Lamb can overlap and be the inside player. Robin would be wide. Thiago might be the inside player, maybe Ribery here, or maybe Thiago stays back and Alaba underlaps. All sorts of different things he did within the same framework. And eventually he started to phase out players like Ribery, and Robin, and in their place he brought in Douglas Costa, who was an attacking winger, Kingsley Cohen, an attacking winger, ended up playing them as wing-backs, but they're not really wing-backs, they're just there in certain phases of play, depending on where the ball is and where the teammates are, sometimes they'd be absolute wingers. And because Lewandowski was a goal machine that you want to support, you then lose this midfield diamond, what you have here. So it's another reason for having the inverted fullbacks, is you then have more players in the middle of the pitch, to control that area. And then as we said, he's focused on the wingers with these players up here, but in doing this and creating this kind of shape like he did, what he accidentally did or on purpose was this, inverting the pyramid. That book by Jonathan Wilson, there's an example of when Guardiola did it at Bayern Munich. But of course, naturally it took Guardiola a while to learn how to adapt to the league he was in and start applying new things that he was learning as well. So one of the things he learned was how to change the way that his team presses and how they want to move the ball after they win the ball back. So we know at Barcelona what would happen if this ball is played it's through to Robin, it's intercepted here. What they would do is they'd all pounce on it, 
to win it back as quickly as possible like this and then what Barcelona would have done was the players would be able to move back into their positions because they were in position to pass the ball around to get back at your structure so you've got control but in Germany what the teams are really good at doing especially Jurgen Klopp's Borussia Dortmund was doing the same thing winning the ball back instantly and then turning it into a transition this player would make a run and suddenly you create chances through that there's that famous Jurgen Klopp quote where he talks about how uh, counter-pressing is a better playmaker than a number 10, basically. You can create chances through teams being in transition. Because, of course, if a player's all surrounding you, your teammates will come and try and get into you, which then leaves space for other players to suddenly get through. So Guardiola added the ability to not only slow play down and have that Spanish La Poza thing that the, his teams have always had, but also to be able to pull off devastating counter-attacks from the counter-press high up the pitch. So his Bayern Munich team had combined both the Barcelona slow possession control to squeeze teams into death to also having that really powerful German transitional moments that they could destroy teams with. But it didn't all go perfectly for Guardiola and Bayern Munich, of course. He's remembered perhaps best for not winning the Champions League rather than all the stuff he did win. And one of the things that comes up in uh, Marty Paranow's books, we should read these by the way, they're brilliant. What he says in these is that there was a couple of games in particular that Guardiola, that kind of defined Guardiola's era there. So there was one game where they lost 4-0 to Real Madrid in the Champions League. He played a 4-2-3-1, a 4-2-4, and they were countered against constantly by a Real Madrid team playing on the counter-attack. And Guardiola had gone against his principles, trying to attack Real Madrid, and trying to play in a way that wasn't suited to what he knows. And another example of it was when they actually beat Borussia Dortmund in a, I think it was a cup game. And what he did was play a 3-5-2, sitting deep, out of possession, knocking the ball long for Muller and Lewandowski to chase up front. Not a very Guardiola thing to do, it's more of a Sam Allardyce thing to do. And they won, but Guardiola was apparently distraught. And the reason he was distraught is because you might win in this style of play, but you can't guarantee anything, you don't have control. So you might win, but you don't have control, which means you cannot dominate, and Pep's teams dominate. And so Guardiola took everything he learned at Barcelona and applied there into Bayern Munich. He made it even better and developed it, and he took all of that to Manchester City. But the first thing he found in the Premier League was that he had a problem to solve, and that problem was the second ball. So he says in the past loads of things about the second ball and how important it is, particularly, there's one quote we've got, said, I was in Munich and I spoke with Xabi Alonso. He said, you have to adapt. It's the second ball, the second ball. And I thought, it's okay, second ball, okay. But really, you have to adapt to the second ball and the third ball and the fourth ball. I never before was focused on that, never. But what does he mean by second ball and third ball and fourth ball? Well, the Premier League's very different again to the Bundesliga in the same way that's different to La Liga. So what you get in England an awful lot of the time is big hoofers up top. So the centre backs will just launch the ball and you've got these big lads here who are easily going to win a header against David Silva, Fernandino, De Bruyne, these sorts of players. And then their players are, get, are designed to be close around that so that they win the ball off this big header and then they move up the pitch. So there's no need for the team to play out from the back, which means the high press that City play is not really in use because they're clearing it and going long. And this was a problem because even when the ball was just in midfield and getting chipped into the box or chipped towards centre backs, it was then coming back towards their players and they were able to get at City. They could basically rough them up by being harder than City's players. So he fixed it in a few different ways. One kind of obvious way was by having uh, a centre back step up from the back. So say this ball goes long and the striker goes for the ball. Rather than having Silva around, he makes sure Silva's ready to win the second ball. Fernandino's ready to win the second ball. Aguero's ready to win the second ball. Because when Diaz steps out to come close, he leaves his space behind. So Diaz comes from here to here to win that header, smash, heads the ball on. And then of course that leaves a bit of space here when he steps forward. So that's why you then get, because it's positional play, he moves slightly in, he moves slightly in, he moves slightly in. So you're protecting all the space. And of course, they're here. So then maybe De Bruyne will pull out a bit more here to protect this space. Maybe uh, Sterling moves inside like that. Everything's done according to where the ball is and where the man is. So that's one example when they win the ball here. And then because the ball bounces loose, these guys all swoop in to make sure they win the second ball, the third ball, fourth ball. That's what they do. Also things like when they're pushing up high, what you see a lot from Man City teams is when they are in the final third and the ball is lost, not from a header or something like that. But say the ball, let's say the ball is put into the box and headed loose and it bounces around a bit. If this team is going to get away on the counter, someone very devious might just step in and make sure the counter attack stops right here. That's what happens. Pep Guardiola has said he does not teach his teams to tactically foul, but all I will say 
is that they definitely do it. <laughs> but of course, over time, we've seen Guardiola apply his principles, things he's learned from the previous two clubs, but then adapt them to the Premier League. It's not just about winning the second balls, it's how his team plays itself as well. So at the start, he had Gael Clichy at left back, and he had Bakary Sanya at right back. That changed. And what happened then was early on, these guys would overlap when your forwards come inside, but the forwards, or the wingers, would always stay wide for the first phase and then move inside. But then what you got slowly was Zinchenko started at left back, being moved from a number 10 position, that's what he was when he signed for them. And then what you get was Zinchenko inverting, just like we saw at Bayern Munich, with Walker here. But Walker didn't play here, Walker instead played as an extra centre back. So the three became like this, then you have the two. Then in midfield you have De Bruyne and David Silva, but David Silva left, in came Ilkay Gundogan. And you get this at certain points, you get a box midfield, so you've got a numerical superiority here, supported by wingers, whether it's Sterling or Sané, take these out, put Bernardo Silva in here, take Sané out, and we'll put in uh, Jack Grealish, wherever he has gone, he's over here, right. And so then you got the forward, either Aguero or Gabriel Jesus. Now, Aguero and Jesus could do this. They could drop in to then form another kind of overload here. So you don't need this, this middle four. And when Aguero went away, we'll put in Jesus. Where is he over here? He's also played roles like a false left winger against Real Madrid when the right back would come up. He would follow him, and then when they go forward, Jesus can go inside because then you get the overlapping wing back going over here. But on our team sheet, it never looked exactly like that, of course. It was very different. So what you might actually thought it looked like was more of a 4-4-2. And for a long period of time, Man City did play this, but it's mostly because of outer possession stuff, because when you've got two blocks of four, like this, it's much harder to break down than when you've got your open kind of shape. So the positional play changed, he adapted the English 4-4-2 to make them hard to break down, high up the pitch. And of course this then changes, you've got two false nines like Fabregas and Messi. You've got wingers who instantly go wide to stretch the play, then one striker goes through, then you've got players who can combine like this with an inverting fullback making the midfield like that. And so everything he's learned over all this time has resulted in this current system which has got them on the brink of a treble. By the time you watch this, they may already have won the treble with the Champions League win. And it is a unit of five individual defenders. These are all centre-backs, all of these guys with John Stone swapping between these two roles here to maintain this positional shape. Then you've got basically five attackers. So De Bruyne, Gundogan, Holland, Grealish and Silva. They're all kind of attackers. So Guardiola in the past has talked about how he'd love a team full of midfielders and now he's kind of got a team without them because he's got all defenders and attackers but he's flooding the midfield with this shape to make sure that he's got numerical advantage in here. All the positional things are in place but he's also got positional and relational parts of the team to make sure he can combine, play the lovely football he wants to and control the counter-attack because when they lose the ball somewhere they've got players in position to be able to win it back high up the pitch with their high line. And if you break this down, it's really, really simple. What he's done is put centre backs here or really good defenders in the defensive section of the pitch, who can also play, sure enough. Uh, but what that means is that they win their individual duels. You have a player who will win a battle against a winger far more likely than an actual full-on fullback. Like Zinchenko will struggle against this kind of right winger if he's really good. Bakayo Saka in this wing, you put a Kanji next to him, you're more likely to win that battle. And then if you put, rather than having a fullback overlap to get one-on-one -on -one with a fullback, if you stick a player whose skill set is dribbling past people one-on-one -on -one with the fullback, you're going to win that battle more than likely. Same thing on, in midfield, you put these players against players, they're going to be better off having these players in the positions that they're in. It all really makes sense. And that has all allowed Guardiola to not only win games in the Premier League, but completely dominate it. And this is how Guardiola has basically broken the Premier League, because before he won the Premier League, these were the points totals. And now he's here, you have to break records to be able to actually win anything. So this is when he hits 100 points, the highest ever in the Premier League. Then Liverpool, the best ever Liverpool team maybe, pushed him to Jurgen Klopp. They had to be better than you can possibly ever be just to beat Guardiola's Man City during a pandemic, that's what happened. Now you have to basically be better than any team's ever been in England in the history of England <laughs> to win the Premier League. Guardiola has done that. And plenty of managers have won stuff, like Antonio Conte got a big load of points when he won the league with Chelsea, for example, but very few can sustain it over a long period of time. But we're starting to see with Guardiola is that he can also do that now, and he's doing it by uh, rotating players and keeping a squad of superstars happy. And one of the ways he does this is, like I say, rotation. And what you'll notice when you look through the starting appearances of Man City's players in the league the last couple of seasons, not everyone plays every single game. In fact, only really Ederson, Rodri this season's played loads, last season Joe Cancelo played loads. But what you get is players like Bernardo Silva and Riyad Mahrez. Here's Silva, here is Riyad Mahrez. They kind of job share on that right wing. 
So you play multiple positions, all these players, so you can take one out, put one in, whether it's to do with form, fitness, or just to make sure they're match fit and keeping everyone happy. So Guardiola is now doing that thing where he's rebuilding a team halfway through a season, but also he's got two separate teams that can play all the way through the season in this positional structure of play, which allows him to dominate games and control everything. He's controlling how fit his squad is, so he can then control the games when he plays them. So what is it that makes Pep Guardiola different to every other manager? Well, he has a defined style of play. You know what a Guardiola team looks like. And within these rules that he's got, he gets the absolute best out of players. He controls possession, he controls out of possession, and that's how he dominates games. Some managers only specialize in either defense or attack. Guardiola's got it all sorted out. And through the system and individual coaching, he's an amazing coach, he makes players better. For example, Fabian Delph once won the Premier League playing as an inverted fullback. Raheem Sterling scored 17, 18 and 20 goals for Man City up front. He scored six for Chelsea this season. Then Lionel Messi, sure enough, he is obviously amazing. But Guardiola saw the room to move him from the right wing into a false nine position. And from there, Barcelona dominated everyone. And Messi ended up scoring something like 79 goals in one year. It's crazy. But Guardiola spotted the potential, moved the position. He's moved multiple players around from positions to make them all better. Look at Bayern Munich and some of the players that he coached there. They're all really, really good. And so when you put all this together, what you get is a team that doesn't only play nice football, but it also wins. But it doesn't just win, it completely dominates. And that is why Guardiola is different to every other manager. Bye! If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic is home to some of the world's best sports journalists, including journalists dedicated to each Premier League team, so every fan gets the coverage they deserve, not just the big clubs. And you can try it for free now for 30 days. See the link in the description.